Sue and Michael were returning to Durban. They left early. I saw them off with immense gratitude. As a dealer and gallery owner, Sue had spent many years building up relationships of trust and respect with the indigenous makers she supported in KwaZulu. Her generosity in sharing those connections had made our time with the Maguaza family and Nestanala possible and memorable. A final breakfast at St. Catherine's, and we were on our way. Thank you, Cathy. It was fantastic. We were headed to Hillfold, the farm and pottery of Lindsay Scott, near Lidgerton in the Natal Midlands. Our next few days would be spent with Lindsay as the guide to the experience of high-temperature wood firing in the Anglo-Oriental tradition. Travelling south, we bypassed Pietermaritzburg and stopped for lunch. Parts of Natal still retained their colonial British flavour. The iconic Howick Hotel was one of them. By 2003, rustic reduction-fired stoneware had fallen out of fashion in South Africa. Local potters schooled in the style struggled to sell their work, and they were few and far between. To gain access to a high-temperature wood-fired kiln for this journey, I turned to Lindsay, a well-known master of ceramic technology and high-firing. Trained in the USA, fiercely intellectual, and ironically skeptical of the Leech tradition, Lindsay was nevertheless a true manifestation of the integration of head, hand, and heart that it proposed. Equal parts potter and scientist, his preference was for high-temperature salt glazing, reduction fired with oil. But his property bore witness to his general passion for kiln building and experimentation. Among the various kilns on site was a small wood kiln built by Natal potter Christo Giles a few years earlier. It was this kiln that we will be firing tomorrow. Lindsay began by describing the role of ash in high temperature glazes and the origin of its use in China. We're using wood and we get the ash and fly ash travel and land it on the pots, and the people who are doing it obviously notice that it starts to melt and then made use of that. Uh, you could say that. Lasers for wood firing begin with the wood ash and you can add other things to make what we might think of as, as proper glazes. The sort of thing you get from ash landing on pots is this, which is very nice. Now whether this all landed on there or whether people learned what was going on, so they just sprinkled the ash maybe on it uh, before they put it in the kiln. <coughs> I'm not sure. The difference, you know, our, our firing would only last, whatever, 12 hours. Whereas traditionally, we had the, the, the uh, Chinese had these huge vill villages, the whole village doing pots and climbing kilns that fired for five or more days. So there was plenty of time for the ash to land on the pots and melt. Whereas in 12 hour firing, you haven't got much time. Uh, also, obviously, a lot depends on the, on the surface, whether it's a vertical surface or a horizontal surface. Uh, most of you, I see, have done things that are more vertical, so that you're obviously not going to have that much ash landing on it. The other thing is the vitrification of the piece. Uh, these are Christos. I haven't done much wood firing myself. Christo is a young potter who's now in Cape Town. He worked here for two years. He actually built the kiln that we're going to use. I was just starting out, and this is one of the early people, uh, ordinary stoneware body. And as you can see, it doesn't do very much. A uh, bit of flash in there, just put a plain chun glaze inside. And then later on, he got to the stage of working with porcelains <coughs> with a little bit of uh, 
terracotta clay added. And you can see this is almost like salt clay. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't expect all your pus to come out like this. Oh. This was a lucky... But that sheen, <laughs> are, is, it, is it the uh, ash? Or is it that lost that... It's like a luster almost. Yeah, yeah it's, it is from the ash. Where the ash is very thin, you can see it's a more orangey brown. Okay. And where it got a lot of ash, uh, you can see it starts to actually make a real celadon-like glaze as well, so it loses that orange color completely. That's a very nice piece. In that firing wood, in that, they all have come out like that wood, it's just in one area of the... Yeah, if you look on that pot, you'll see the front part with the badge there, and there's a heavy, heavy bit of flash, a lot of ash landed there, so it was probably facing oh. the firebox where the flames were coming in, so it got a lot. The, the back of it, you'll see, is very, almost dry. <coughs> now, there's no glaze on the outside. That's the body. Okay. This is what I mean. If you get the right kind of body, like a porcelain, which is going to get soft and sticky quite early on, it's going to catch the ash. And particularly if it's not too dark, you get that. Oh, so the outside, there's the the no glaze on the outside. Yeah. That's right. This is a much more refractory body. So the ash was probably most of the time was just hitting it and falling off, getting on the kiln shelf rather than the pot. Uh, so did you make it? Uh, I've got little um, itching discs that I stamped quickly when we were leaving. But Lindsay's got something beautiful. Got beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <coughs> I've never had much luck with wood ash. I think it's a good If you do want to get into wood ash glazing, they say that. Uh, Twigs are much better than big trees. Like I burn a lot of uh, white oil out for my fire, but I don't use it. So I found the ash doesn't. It's not very exciting. I do want to talk about uh, 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 grass ash, which is a lot of what I use. It's really amazing stuff, actually. It's really incredible stuff to use. Grass. It's much better than things like CMC and that for holding the glaze on the pot. It's incredible stuff. And you can. It's so light if you. If you've got about 30%, it's, it's more than half of it will be the ash, actually, because it's so light. And you can have it about that thick on the glass. But the other thing about grass ash glazes is, is the, the, the uh, substances like phosphorus and all the things you don't get in normal glaze materials are in them. And they give a kind of smoky, as a silicon. I mixed this one. I don't know how these will come out in this kiln because I fire the normally in here at the, to a much higher temperature. <coughs> but that, these are the same glaze, but I just dumped 5% just of the wood, uh, of the grass ash into that. Is it any grass or is it specific grass that you use? Does it make a difference? At uh, this time of the year, today is quite windy, so they probably weren't burning, but you'll find everyone's burning fire breaks. So oh, this is just the indigenous grass? It's grass. just a touching just grass. Okay. Yeah. In China and Japan, they use the rice, rice husk glaze. Okay, one, another big difference, by the way, between grass ash and wood ash is grass ash is, is, what's, is a very hard ash, also like rye, bamboo, they're really grasses and they make a very hard ash, meaning that they're very high in, in silica, which is the main glass former. Whereas wood ashes are very high in uh, calcium and they make those very runny, in fact, wood ash will melt by itself into a glaze of some sort. But grass ash is very, very hard and uh, will not melt by itself. It's, it's like uh, pure silica, which is a very, very difficult substance to melt. It's the main glass form in it, right? mm -hmm. but you need to add fluxes to it to melt it. <coughs> okay, the Z was very keen on uh, chinos, but, but these are my chinos that are fired in there with a very heavy reduction, so I don't think it's going to work. It also helps to have a dark body. I made a few pots with a dark body and I've done this and see what happens. But I think most of you have used that uh, Chinese porcelain. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I mixed this glaze, which is actually like an ash glaze. Mm -hmm. Again, this is fired in this kiln. I don't know what it will do. The very runny glazes. So you can either just do the insides of your pots with them, sort of like Christo did on the outside mm -hmm. too. Do what it does. Hope that the ash does nice things. Uh, or I mix with those test. I mix these as well. So 
This is more like a straightforward salad and it's not going to be runny <coughs> at all. Might not even, I don't know what it will do at that temperature because it's fired very high. But uh, it's up to you. I'll put them both out there. I would tend to stick to this runny glaze because I think it will melt more easily. If you do add the runny glaze to the pot, put it on the outside, put it right near the top so it's got a lot of room to run down, otherwise it's going to end up all over your kiln shelves. Okay, are there any other things I should cover before we start? Are you going to still glaze something? Because it would be nice to, for people to see how uh, you apply the I glaze. I've actually got mine done out of the way. So. You've done it, okay. Would you maybe demonstrate on somebody? I'll take some on, so. Yeah, just to show the application, because it's much, much thicker than we used to with earthenware. So you've got ash one, and what's the other one called? E3A. Sorry? <laughs> can we, can one we... This has actually got a bit of that grass ash in, so you can see what it's like. Okay, can we christen them with, like, poetic names? Yeah. <laughs> like... Well, grass ash flakes. <laughs> Here we are, like Grass, grass, yes. grass ash flakes. Midland blues. <laughs> <laughs> Midland <laughs> green. You're yeah. drinking that Moor coffee. This exactly. looks like the Moor glaze, this one. Okay, Midland Moor. Midland Moor. But don't tell me, Pate. <laughs> and this one looks very smooth. So this is the this, this is, is the one with the grass. One. This is the slick, slick and, and this is smooth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So now you've got to take your pick. Can we combine? Which one's more interesting? One on each part. More interesting. What is Probably this one, I think. Uh, I would think. Yeah. It's more likely to melt as well. Is it, that that is, see, when you get that salmon <coughs> flush on your on your thing. This is well fired, very high reduction. Again, there are quite a lot mm. of variations depending on how thick I make it. Mm. And I've found I enjoy spraying it, so I sprayed those, so there will be some sheenas in. If you want to dip, here's a sheena, this N2A is a sheena. Mm. But you, you're concerned about the temperature we fire into in terms of the No, it's people who do a lot of wood firing usually say you don't get enough reduction, and also the Ash kind of bleaches it, it takes away the orange colour. After Lindsay's introduction, glazing commenced. Each of the group had made a teapot and a few cups using imported Chinese porcelain at Frank's studio a few weeks prior to our departure. The design brief was to alter the form slightly to introduce some elements of irregularity as per the aesthetics of Japanese tea. Adding some terracotta clay to the porcelain was also encouraged. I had asked Lindsay to make up some Celadon and Shino glazes to complement the forms. Da langs die kiln. Wat is in? Daar waar die zeker blokje staan. Wat? Once everything had been glazed, Lindsay began loading, using kiln shelves covered with a really thick layer of kiln wash to resist the wood ash, which could cause the pots to stick. What somebody can do for me is go to my big kiln there, with a bag, and bring different brick sizes, small ones just to the Clarissa and Chiago rolled pellets of fire clay, which Lindsay used to stabilize the shelf props. <laughs> <laughs> Encouraged and then discouraged by Nikki, Lindsay's neighbor's dog was determined to participate. Yeah, I just said, come, come, get up. <laughs> Don't even know what it means. There are so many variables with reduction firing, and they multiply exponentially when wood is used as the fuel. 
The placement of the pieces in the kiln critically affects the amount of heat and ash they receive. Loading is a lengthy, painstaking process. To get the benefit of varied results, we mixed up the cups so that each person would have one or two on each shelf. Yes, that would be brilliant. Look, those three are pretty similar. They are they? similar, and yeah. these two can also go with them. Yeah. And then maybe Chiego's is the biggest, I think. Maybe it could go with Lindsay's. Yeah. You know, he's got higher things. Okay, now I think Lindsay will sort out his own. First, just to make sure we get them in, I think we better do that. Mm. <clears throat> How many times have you fried this film? I've never fired it. I've <laughs> 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 well, been fired. Krista has fired it about four times. So. Okay. <clears throat> what other cones you've got in? 2, 10 and 13. I've got high hopes of getting to 13. What's the temperature of 13? 13 is 1350. Is it? Yeah, 1350. Made this out. This is just fire clay. Mm -hmm. A dash of cement in it. And then it's got... You can see here on this side where there's the mud away. Mm. Mm. A bit of blanket. <clears throat> All right. Oh no. Don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have it. Some, it looks like some people have got my, my grass ash on, oh. which hasn't been touching. So. Oh, okay. oh. so it'll just do nothing? It might just uh, be unmelted. I see. I'm in a very oh. uncomfortable position. Maybe, maybe you should blow it off. Yeah, sure. Could we blow it off? Maybe. Yeah. You can try it. Mm. Uh, a slight covering probably won't matter. The sun glaze will... Despite Lindsay's careful explanation of the refractory nature of grass ash, some of the group had sprinkled it on top of their glazed teapots. It was decided to remove it, to avoid the possibility of dry, unmelted patches on the fire glaze. Lindsay's careful loading fitted everything in. His taller pieces were perfect for the top shelf. These are fire clay. The whole kiln is made except the bottom. Christo's door bricks were custom made from fire clay, with peepholes for the cones. Uh, did, you, did you bring the barometer? I did, yeah. Otters often keep their cones out of sentiment as much as science. The inconsistency of these records of past firings was a little disconcerting. Fingers crossed that we would do better. The kiln had not been fired for about three years. Its roof had sagged slightly. So inserting the top brick was a bit of a challenge. Finally, once all was in place, Lindsay explained the use of the grates and the principles of downdraft firing. The Chinese were the first to develop uh, porcelain and stone because they were the first people to develop a downdraft kiln. And uh, the Western kilns fired went right through the kiln and came out the top. <clears throat> it was almost, there was a bottle, bottle shape. Fire was made at the bottom and went right through. 
So that, that would be called updraft because the draft is going bottom to top all the way. In this kind of kiln you have the fire at the bottom as well. It comes in, can't get directly out. It goes up to oh, the top wow. and then it works its way down through the setting to the bottom again. Uh, and it comes out the bottom and goes up the chimney. And it's a much more efficient use of heat. Uh, it's very good for reduction type firings as well. The updraft, what you tend to get is good reduction at the bottom near the flame and then as, as you go up you get more and more oxidizing. It was hard to get a nice even over the reduction. <coughs> because part of what we're going to be doing here tomorrow is a reduction firing. Most of you probably work with electric kilns which are oxi oxidation firing. This is quite an interesting design. It is, you throw the wood in and it will burn on the top and then the coals drop through to the bottom and so you've got almost like a double <coughs> you've got heat going in through the top and the space in here gets incredibly hot and it's sucking air through there and it has to come through there into the kiln. Oh, by the way, with a downdraft kiln, so you've got a firebox on each side here on this, this in front of the kiln, you've got the firebox here. The other side is on the other side. Mm -hmm. So, on this firebox, the flames go right through and enter the kiln over here and come up around. And then on that firebox, they will obviously come right through and go up the side of the kiln and down. Um, so we hope it will work. <laughs> <laughs> Christos, you said the grates should make it. Gee, I, look, I pulled the grates out and they all fell apart, so I spent all yesterday doing the grates. How much would you need for those? I don't know, I got about five or six bucky loads. <coughs> that's all pine, that's just because that's what's available. Christo said he tried wattle, and wattle, the coals were too big, you know, they didn't burn away. It's actually, wattle is great oh. for your fireplace fires, but mm -hmm. it's got a lot of energy as well. You can yeah. see when you make a fire with wattle as opposed to a gum. Yeah. You get much more heat from a water fire, but apparently the coals build up in here too quickly and then you don't get the uh, same sort of heat rise. Pine burns very fast and releases its heat very fast, so it's very good for... But you've got to stoke it very... Yeah. And all the time? I think the technical information was a bit overwhelming, new and mysterious for the group. We agreed to start the firing at 6.30 a.m. and went out for dinner. We're going for a nice dinner tonight. It's a restaurant called Porcelli's. It's actually an Australian chef and he takes great <coughs> pride in his, in his fish. <laughs> he prepares it beautifully. I hope he doesn't let me down. <laughs>